In this series, we speak to inspirational people who are working in global health. They share their journeys about where in the world they have worked, the issues they are passionate about, and how they got involved. Whether they are students, young professionals, or established in their careers, they all have one thing in common, to change this world for the better. Coming up in this episode, we speak to Professor Dermot O'Donovan about how a 24 hour fast for concern in secondary school led him to studying medicine, working in Crumlin Hospital, and then on to Zambia and providing support during the Ebola epidemic in Sierra Leone and Nigeria. Dermot talks about equality, about equity and justice, and the need for change in the way that we think and frame global health. It took me a while to recognise that all global issues are local issues and that anything about achieving health equity for people everywhere means achieving health equity where we are, um, no matter where that is. So global health applies everywhere. It doesn't mean you have to get on a plane. It doesn't mean you have to go somewhere. It doesn't mean you have to be doing something somewhere else. We need to be thinking about partnership and reciprocity and working together. Dermot O'Donovan is a Professor of Global Health at Queen's University Belfast and a consultant in public health at the Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland. Until 2019, he was the Director of Public Health in the HSC West and he was a Senior Lecturer in Social and Preventive Medicine in NUI Galway. He has lived and worked in several countries in Africa. His work has included clinical, research, education and policy aspects of HIV, of maternal and child health and research capacity building. He is one of the founders of the Irish Global Health Network. So I am here today with Dermot O'Donovan, Professor Dermot O'Donovan. It is super to be talking to you today, Dermot. Thanks, Nadine. Great to be here. So just to start off, um, how about telling us a little bit about how did you get involved in global health in the beginning and why did you get involved? OK, so what's the beginning and what's global health? When I was in school, I organised the Concern Fast for the town I lived in. Um, and out of that, we had a third world society in school. Um, I got involved with having various NGOs coming to the school. I didn't know they were called NGOs at the time, but I was interested in development and I was interested in health. Um, and I remember talking to career guidance about, can you do these things? And that didn't seem to be possible. I also wanted to do economics and sociology. That was, you couldn't do all these things together. But anyway, um, I ended up, I did medicine and uh, all the time I was doing medicine, I had the intention of going to work somewhere poor, um, something related to, the kinds of things I've seen in Concern and in, I saw this documentary in the late 1970s called Five Minutes to Midnight that made an enormous impression on me. Um, so I, I went and did medicine through, at the time I was doing medicine, I, I was thinking about working with children and something around hunger, or something about maternal health that wasn't really clear. Um, I had the opportunity to do an elective in Kenya when um, in my fourth year in medical school and that opened my eyes to the bigger world out there. Now, at the same time, um, the person who organised the concern fast with me in school um, and I, uh, who I, we subsequently got married, she ended up working in concern um, and she was working in concern during the Ethiopia famine and during a whole lot of other things like that. So. Uh, we, we both wanted to work and do things that were related to health development, something like that. Uh, very difficult to get two jobs um, in different places, but eventually we ended up working in Zambia where Mary got a job um, running a development office for an Irish mission. Um, and there was a hospital next door that had a vacancy for a doctor. So that we got started working in that kind of way. Um, I, after that, I did general practice um, and I was sort of becoming aware of public health, even though I was an acting medical officer for a while when I was in, in uh, Zambia, but I, a lot of it hadn't struck me. Um, but I had an opportunity to work for Concern in Sudan um, in an emergency during that time. Um, and then we ended up work, going to work in the Gambia. I got a job with the British Medical Research Council on an HIV project and Mary got a job with UNDP. So we were thinking like the, now we talk about Global health is around something that's around improving health and health equity for all people everywhere. 
So I was thinking about people in poor parts of the world and other parts of the world and not as conscious of people where I lived at home. Um, before going to Zambia, I worked in paediatrics in Dublin and just around the time that the first HIV cases in children were being identified in Ireland. Um, and I've seen the link between poverty and drug use and HIV and what was going to become bigger. Um, when I went to Zambia, HIV was a huge issue, but hadn't yet been recognized or wasn't acknowledged. Uh, while I was there, the president of Zambia, Kenneth Kunda, made an announcement at a global AIDS conference that HIV affected every household in Africa, and that changed things dramatically. Um, so I, I went to work in Zambia, having been working in Crumlin um, in paediatrics. So Crumlin is the national, it was the national referral hospital for child health in Ireland at the time. Um, I'd been working in paediatric intensive care. Um, you know, where the sickest children in Ireland were referred. And it's still a relatively rare thing for a child to die. And the what could be done for those children was incredible. And I arrived out to um, Zambia um, and my first night on call, I was, I was there to be the paediatrician in the children's ward. So the children's ward had 70 cots. The first night I was there, there was 200 people. Um, it was the middle of the malaria season. There was it was noisy, there was a lot of crying, and there were three deaths by 10 o'clock that night. So I came home 10 o'clock saying, I'm going home, I can't do this, you know. That, and that sort of thing just also brought home to me just how grossly unfair the world is. Um, and, you know, the, it, it, things are different in Zambia, but it, there are still parts of the world where life is like that. And that, that's really unacceptable. It's something that we, you know, as humans, we, we shouldn't allow or accept that that's the way the world is. So, I mean, the, 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 the key thing for me is that I, it, it took me a while to recognize that all global issues are local issues and that anything about achieving health, or health equity for people everywhere means achieving health equity where we are, um, no matter where that is. Um, so, you know, global health applies everywhere. It doesn't mean you have to get on a plane. It doesn't mean you have to go somewhere. It doesn't mean you have to be doing something somewhere else. Another issue, I suppose, is that I probably came to some of these ideas from a kind of a charity model. Um, and I realized that that is not the way to be thinking. We need to be thinking about partnership and reciprocity and working together. Um, so there's a lot of different things tied up together. So when, when you ask where to begin, I guess, school. And I think that's probably where we need to be paying attention to people as well because people have lots of great ideas in school and we need to be able to encourage them yeah yeah what a story and it also it's like where does it begin and um and of course it's still a journey and and your your career and as you've moved along it continues to change i know one of the um you, you mentioned that you were um you were working in uh, you know you're working in an emergency setting i know you worked on ebola um, what was that like? Where were you and what was that like? And then how, what has that been like over the last year as COVID has, has, has hit the world? What kind of lessons have we, have you learned about Ebola that we should be taking on here for COVID? Uh, um, I had the privilege and opportunity. I mean, I've had such great opportunities, um, but I had the privilege to work in Nigeria and Sierra Leone during the Ebola outbreak. Um, it sort of came about that there was a call through WHO, GORN, the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network for people. Um, and I sent off an expression of interest, got an email back that evening saying, can you be on a plane on Monday? Um, my yellow fever was out of date. And in the few days it took me to get a new yellow fever, the outbreak started in Nigeria. So I went to Nigeria instead of Sierra Leone. And I saw what how the outbreak in Nigeria was managed and contained and the fantastic response that happened there. Um, I ended up in Sierra Leone about uh, three months later, which was the other end of the spectrum. You know, it was really difficult to manage. You didn't have the infrastructure, you didn't have the just the wealth and the capacity that Nigeria had to be able to do it. Um, but I, the most striking thing and the thing I learned probably, it's the poorest people that are worst affected, that Ebola, like COVID and lots of other things, is it's not so much a pandemic as a syndemic. You're hearing this word more and more. It's a synergy of epidemics, um, not just the infectious disease, but the underlying things that influence that. And it's poverty and injustice and other things that make that so much worse. 
Um, the other thing that, I mean, Ebola gave everybody in the global north and the global south a sense of interdependence and the fear that goes with that. And we've had some of that with COVID as well and the misinformation that goes with that. And I think we probably need to be doing very much more about misinformation. And that's um, an issue that's coming to a head for us with COVID and um, looking at what's happening in India, but even at the moment, um, you're hearing stories about stigma, about COVID in many parts of the world. Um, you have people not coming forward for testing because of the stigma um, and all the different things that go with that. So, I mean, there, there are so many different elements of it. The big uh, learnings and one of the really fantastic things that I saw in Nigeria was the volunteering. Um, every morning outside the emergency operations centre in Lagos, there were lines of people queuing up to volunteer to see what they could do. Uh, there were lots of different organisations and agencies involved, so lots of people were deployed to go door to door with hand washing and other activities like that. But there was this fantastic coming together of the community that was really, really great to see. Mm -hmm. So Dermot, you know, when you go and you, you do a piece of work like that and then you come back to Ireland, what, what do you bring back with you from, for instance, your experience in Nigeria and Sierra Leone? And how does that change what you're actually doing? And I know for you um, over the past few years, it's been teaching. Yeah, well, I mean, when I was in Nigeria and Sierra Leone, I was also working in public health in the HSE in Ireland. Um, and I was part of the Ebola response in Ireland as well. So, I mean, it was very useful to have seen close hand up close how contact tracing worked and worked when you had to make it work um, and seeing the differences in the ways um, it happened in Nigeria where you had good high-tech mobile phone communication and all that kind of thing and Sierra Leone where you had people going out on motorbikes with no mobile phone coverage trying to chase up information and try to bring it back um, so I mean, there's, it's really useful to see that the practicality of that and then to see how that might work on the ground at home. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I, I, I was teaching um, in Ireland. I was teaching in Galway in the University in Galway until two years ago, uh, where I, was, I coordinated the undergraduate medical public health course. It, well, it was called social and preventive medicine it used to be called and then it became part of a wider subject called health and disease medical curriculums are changing all the time while i was in Goa as well a great colleague made me win on uh, who's an obstetrician in castle bar and i started a, an optional module for students who are interested in healthcare and resource poor settings um, and this grew and um, the first couple of years we had like 10 12 15 students we had we were turning them down at one stage then we just couldn't handle it when it got to 40, 50. Um, but we used to take them to ACL uh, to try to do, do exercises like where you simulate um, road traffic injury and they would simulate emergency obstetric and neonatal care um, incidents um, and maybe get the GP in ACL who's also living in a relatively resource poor setting come and talk about how to deal with crises. We had the Mayo Mountain Rescue people come and talk about you know, how do you get somebody down off the side of a mountain, which is quite similar to how do you get somebody, you know, on the side of a mountain in Tanzania, uh, as it is in, in Mayo. That, that's morphed into a course that's now available to people in the health service. Um, and something that hopefully through the Irish Global Health Network can grow as well, because there's a bigger audience out there that want to learn more about health and development and not just those sort of practical things but just to be exposed to the kinds of issues that people have to live with um, but I had also um, shortly after I moved to Ireland uh, students had asked me several times to talk about working overseas and I'd done that and um, students were asking about having more classes on that so with a couple of colleagues we set up a course on that we called international health to start with and that morphed into a course on global health and development um, and the medical school was very open to it. We became the first medical school in Ireland that had a core part of the curriculum in global health. Um, and you see over the last 15, 20 years, there's been such a change and a, 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 an interest from students, but also from the wider public around these sorts of issues. Um, but I, I'm, I'm slightly concerned that the global health means health somewhere else or something like that as well, because it does mean if it is truly about inequity and about addressing issues, you know, improving health for everyone, we have to look right outside our doors as well. So uh, 
I, that's something we just need to be careful of. I'm lucky now I work in Belfast in the medical school where the new undergraduate curriculum has global health as a theme throughout all four years and the global health or all five years and global health includes public health and the social determinants of health and social accountability and sustainability and multiple other themes that we are threading all the way through. But it's interesting to see how the, the language is shifting and changing around that as well. Yeah, and for sure, I mean, you know, global global health with COVID, I think if, if people didn't know before, people are much more aware of global health, you know, we're, we're mm. all safe when everybody is safe, we're all safe. And, and those messages that really have been really brought home to us. Yeah, um, and that interdependence, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, you know, you're so passionate, you've been speaking for years and, you know, about equality and equity and inclusion. And I just wonder, particularly with equal equality and, and equity, what is the difference? and why are they important when we're talking about issues within global health? I guess equality is all about where everybody gets the same kind of thing um, and you try to ensure that everybody is getting an equal share of the pie or something like that but it doesn't mean it's necessarily fair because some people need more than others um, where equity is about getting people more the supports that individuals need that would make them closer and you know, it'll be more fairly distributed um, there's a whole lot of language around it. I'm learning this language myself, but I mean, underpinning all of that is this whole idea of justice, you know, where you get rid of the problem, the things that are causing the inequity. We also have to think about this term structural violence, that there are structures in society that disadvantage people, you know, from adverse childhood experiences to poverty to all kinds of other things that we need to think about and consider that these things need to be addressed in order to enable people to have equal and equitable health um, and you know, in terms of education as well it's probably increasingly important that we're learning to use the language of rights more um, and it's interesting working in Northern Ireland where the language of rights is almost every day like people use and think about rights and you hear references to it much more than you do in Southern Ireland and in many other parts of the world um, but we could be you know, approaching health issues in Ireland and in Northern Ireland and any country that you'd like to think of, we could be thinking about rights-based approaches to health and to health systems and to health services. Um, and I think that's probably a shift that's, that's coming and it's, the, the language is becoming more widespread as we talk about COVID as well. Um, Dermot, I want to ask you, um, I know you've been involved in an initiative over the years called the Equals Initiative, a very interesting initiative. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Why did you get involved and what does that do? Um, the Equals Initiative started um, Frank Murray, who, used to, who was the president of the College of Physicians, got a phone call from somebody who knew somebody in a hospital in Zambia that needed equipment. It turned out to be the same hospital I had worked in, and Frank had been there as a medical student. Um, so the, that led to a whole discussion about equipment um, and healthcare equipment and how that might be um, mobilised from this part of the world to other parts of the world. So the Equals Initiative has become a partnership between the Health Service Executive in Ireland, the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland, um, and the primarily the Ministry of Health in Zambia. So uh, when I worked in Zambia, um, I left Zambia in 1990. I was replaced by the first Zambian doctor to work in the hospital. Um, Zambia was producing 50 doctors a year since independence. Um, that's far too few but um, like 10 years ago there were only 1500 doctors in a country of 17 million people um, so there's been an expansion in medical education there's been an expansion in healthcare, care and expansion in hospital care now you need a lot more than hospital care obviously you need to develop primary care and community health workers and all sorts of other people as well but there's been this massive expansion in medical education and with that there's been a demand for equipment to run hospitals and health centres. And side by side with that, there's a requirement to maintain equipment. So the Equals Initiative has morphed from something that was providing equipment to now providing training uh, or contributing to the training of healthcare engineering staff. And for the first course in Zambia on training people who would maintain biomedical equipment. Um, at the time of the Equals Initiative started, there were only four such courses on the continent. And now there are many more, 
but it's it, it's it's a much more integrated thing than just providing equipment. It links the equipment into the training of healthcare professionals and the training of doctors, but also into the training of the people who maintain the equipment that ultimately improve the chances for people um, in terms of access to healthcare and the, the facilities and equipment that are needed to deliver um, healthcare. Mm. I guess it's like that, um, you know, the equipment on its own is not going to be enough. It's about how do you use that equipment? How do you maintain that equipment and the training and the capacity that's required within the local team of people um, is, is, of course, really, really important. And um, I just would love to Absolutely. ask you, yeah. Um, yeah. go ahead, Dermot. I've also seen you know, in various places I've worked in, you see all kinds of stuff donated primarily from the global north that once it breaks down, once one little piece goes in it, it's junk. And there are these rooms full of donated equipment that can't be used in many health facilities all over sub-Saharan Africa and beyond. Um, so the maintenance and the training of people to maintain equipment is hugely important. And it almost speaks to that, you know, you were mentioning the charity, you know, the idea, the charity model. It's not always about donating. Donating is just not, uh, it's not enough. Um, yeah, I wonder it's, it's, yeah. sustainability is built, you know, there has to be an element of the, the donation being able to be sustainable and beyond. Um, and we're even seeing it now with all, you know, the calls for equipment, the COVID related equipment to various parts of the world. There's issues about you know, ensuring it gets to the right place. Can it be maintained? Are all the various parts going to be available? Um, are there going to be, you know, because a lot of this equipment, it's more than just plug it in, you need various reagents or other, other consumables that go with it. Will all of those things be available? Mm. And Dermot, I know you were among, um, you know, the small group of people that founded the Irish Global Health Network um, over 15 years ago. I just wonder, what have you seen in terms of change in global health in Ireland? And, you know, is there something that we should be being cautious about? Or, you know, how is global health in the, into the future? Um, how do you see that? Um, I suppose the, the first meeting of what became the Irish Forum for Global Health and then the Irish Global Health Network was the, the ideas at the beginning were to link people that were involved in education and research and um, policy and practice, primarily in healthcare in the global south and linking them together in terms of you know, being able to you know, have people to talk to, but to share resources and information as well. Um, and when you see what the network has done, particularly in the last year, you see that that's happening on a huge scale. Um, I think there's still, a, there's a lot to be done about pro providing um, educational resources that could be available to all sorts of people everywhere. And again, the, you can see elements of that happening through the, the, the network and the ESTR partnerships and other things that have come out of that. Um, I think the research links happen and will happen there's other mechanisms for that to happen but the influencing policy and in, in ireland and you know globally is probably something that we could probably be doing more about as well um we, we, we could be training people more in advocacy and how to advocate and how to contact and how to how to influence people um but having the network there in itself is a fantastic resource for to build on all of that mm. And Dermot, you know, you've been in, in Galway and now in Queen's University, you're surrounded by young people. You're working with young people every day, um, med students and others interested in getting involved in global health. From your own experience, do you have any wisdom that you would share to somebody who's just starting out and kind of looking, looking ahead and, and maybe the same as you, just have an interest in, 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 in global issues? Yes, you go for it, you know, learn all you can, listen, you know, find out all you can, uh, take opportunities and take experiences as you can. I don't think that there's a straight line, you know, there's not, it's, it's not like you can do this qualification and you'll get that job and you'll then be doing it. I don't think there's a line like that. Um, there's so much, it, the breadth of global health and public health is enormous. Um, I mean, the, in um, England, the Academy of Medical Sciences has produced a report in the last few years on the uh, future public health workforce and the future of public health. And it's, you know, it's stressing that so many people are doing this. This is not something for just health professionals. You know, there's people across the board involved in global health. Um, and we need to you know, enable and link people and 
ensure that it's inclusive in its own way. Um, at the same time, we need to be very careful to watch this whole idea of the charity side of it. And we also need to be aware of, you're aware of the growing language about the decolonization of global health. Um, I, think I read somewhere recently that there's been over 50 papers in the last year alone published on the decolonizing. So we have to think about where, where what global health really means when so much of global health activity is coming from the global north, if you like, rather than from the global south. The centers where you can teach, learn, and research global health tend to be in the global north, not so much on the curriculum in the global south. Um, the whole idea of the different organizations that are headquartered in you know, the big cities in the global north, um, many of the NGOs headquartered in the global north. Now, there are many are making efforts to address that. It's also about who's employed, what the terms of employment are. There's so many different things that are all tied up in this that we need to consider how to address that to make it global health itself fair and equitable. Dermot, thank you so much for being with us and thank you for all that you have done and continue to do uh, to inspire all of us in global health. Thank you, Nadine, and thank you and all your colleagues. The network is a great organisation and long may it last. So thank you for joining us today. If you want to know more or get involved in the Irish Global Health Network, then go to our website. You can sign up for free to become a member at www.globalhealth.ie. And we very much look forward to the next episode.